worship together. So we as a family have got lots of Christmas traditions. Two weeks ago, I talked about some of our Christmas traditions as I got a chance to preach with you and share some of our Christmas unwrapping um, things that we do and the poems that my dad used to write. But one of the things that's sort of kind of creeping in as a Christmas tradition, and I don't know that my family who's down here, I don't even know if they would really identify it yet, but I noticed something yesterday we did our, our immediate family, just Mandy and Madison, Luke and Jacob. We opened presents and did it because we'll be on the road late tonight and out back to Alabama, 12 hours away. Appreciate your prayers with a dog and three beautiful children and a wonderful wife driving. Get in about 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, y'all pray for me. But I noticed yesterday that there's this kind of tradition that's creeping into our family, and it's the, the movie Elf. You guys with Will Ferrell? I know Will Ferrell's in some pretty bad movies. Funny guy. I wish you would clean it up sometime. But that's just a classic movie, right? And I noticed we have to watch that every year. And the kids have started asking, hey, we got to watch Elf. And we're actually unwrapping our presents. And somebody, I don't know who it was, made a point to make sure it was on the TV and it was muted. So it's like becoming this thing. How many of you guys, that's like a becoming a tradition for you got to watch Elf. That's like the new classic. Yeah, yeah. What about um, Christmas Story? You guys know that you'll shoot your eye out. Some of our older generations, there we go. Some of them are, yep, I remember that one. How about, oh, here's a great one, Home Alone. Home Alone, yeah, oh, it's the best, man. My kids love Home Alone. And then, um, this is not one of my favorites. I just didn't grow up around it, but a Charlie Brown Christmas. Charlie Brown, I can't even say it right. Charlie Brown Christmas, yeah, some up in the balcony are really excited about that one. They were like, yes, yes. And it was an adult back there. It's like super excited. <laughs> now we're going to throw way back. It's a wonderful life. Yeah, there we go. Getting a little sentimental. Miracle on 34th Street. Are we getting too far back? No? No? All right. Got some waving their hands, shaking their canes at me. I didn't say that out loud. I was, oh, I didn't say that. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. That one scares me. Those old, like, claymation, whatever that is, those just kind of freak me out. I don't know what it is, but... And I could mention more and more and more and more. And all these movies give us this feel-good feeling. This kind of helps us get into this nostalgic feeling of Christmas, does it? And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it helps us kind of fall into this warm and fuzzy feeling this time of the year. And they're fantastic stories about spreading Christmas cheer, about being a good person... Great plots to these movies about how generosity can change a person, right? And just kind of seeing a person that's kind of a Scroogey Christmas, Scrooge, see their hearts transformed by the message of Christmas and how being kind and helping a friend can help you make the difference in life. Lots of good moral stories that they send us to. But I believe that there's one thing that many of us here in Pittsburgh watch on TV and we instantly know it is officially Christmas season. Now, those of you who call Northway your home and are here every week, I already see your judgmental eyes. You're like, how do you know that? You're from Alabama and you've only been here six, six months. I know people, okay? I know people and I've talked around and I've noticed this on TV and it started a couple, about a month or so ago, right after Thanksgiving and I began to ask around about it and sure enough, it showed up in our sermons and instantly as I talk with people who are true Pittsburghans, what do you guys call yourselves? Burgers? See, I can't say that. That's weird. I'm not just like calling you like Pittsburgh asparaguses or something. That doesn't make any sense. But anyways, to each his own. And so I feel these vibes kind of come up inside of you whenever you see this come on TV. And it actually dates all the way back to the 80s. Anybody yet think you're figuring out what I'm talking about? Anybody? Check this out on the screen and see if you guys know this. <laughs> special lift you get this holiday season lasts all year long. Happy Holidays from Eaton Park. Yay! <laughs> See, I'm becoming one of you Pittsburghers. So strange. I gotta tell you this, I, and we'll come back to that. So I came in, I was very surprised by how dressed up most of you are this morning. 
Like I came in and Pastor Brian's over here. It used to be your campus pastor, Miss Julie, and the beautiful girls. They continue to worship with us. Brian, we know you got a new ministry. Glad you're here. And he comes in and I'm just like. And Kristen, who's hiding, Matt's uh, wife, I, I actually said that in our production meeting before you guys get here. I said, man, you guys are all dressed up so nice. And she's like, is she even Matt? She even did the country accent as best she could. Well, y'all don't do that in the country. <laughs> So I don't know where you think I'm from. Just because I'm from Alabama doesn't mean it's the country, okay? I'm from the Rocket City, one of the smartest cities in the nation. But anyway, I was blown away by how... But you know it's Christmas. Apparently, you guys are fired up about Christmas today. And when this TV commercial comes on in Pittsburgh, you feel the sentiment. It's connected to tradition, and it fills us with anticipation to celebrate Christmas together. And I believe that these warm, fuzzy feelings that we get over these movies and the stories and the commercials at this time of year, it touches really, honestly, the deepest part of who we are, but more importantly, who we long to be and what we long for in the rest of the year. Eden Park nailed it in 1982 when they said, we hope the special lift you get this holiday season lasts all year long. And I think that that's our hope too. That's in deep inside. We would love to feel what we feel right now today. The anticipation, the feeling we have all year long. And then we come to church, we come to a service such as today, in the Christmas season, we hear the familiar story of Jesus being born. It makes us feel good. It's such a positive and encouraging tradition, a wonderful tradition. And I mean, Christmas and babies, you can't, you can't go wrong there, right? Most of us kind of leave it there at this baby Jesus in a manger in Christmas. And it's like, oh, check this out. We've got a couple pictures for you, Christmas and babies. Look at the first one here. Oh, I mean, you can't go wrong. It gets better. Number two, check this out. Getting some red. Look at those beautiful blue eyes. But this last one's my favorite. Look. He's like, get me out of this. But I mean, this is what a lot of us think of at Christmas. It kind of leaves us with this, oh, baby Jesus. Christmas healthy feeling, but I want to read something else that's very familiar to help move us past just the emotion. Luke chapter 2 verses 8 through 14 says this, and we should have it on our screen for you to follow along. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And that's a whole sermon in and of itself, but if you have your notes or you have a a phone and can highlight or underline, underline that where it says they were filled with great fear. When God shows up, let me just say this, I'll get off script a second. When God shows up, it isn't um, oftentimes, most times when you read in the scriptures, it's not this wonderful praise, hallelujah, dancing around, shouting for joy moment. When the, when the power of God shows up in people's life, oftentimes in the scriptures, the first inclination is fear. Because they're standing before a holy God and they finally realize who they are in light of a holy God. Praise the Lord for Jesus, which is our purpose today. Amen? But there was fear that fell upon them. And the angel said to him, Fear not, for behold, I bring good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those whom He is pleased. Friends, we read this story at this time of years and great memories flood back. We read this story and we remember the good even amidst the hard times. But maybe for you, you hear this story every year and it causes you to wonder. It causes confusion, perhaps. Is this story like every other feel-good story? Is it like all the movies I watch? Is it like the commercials that I see? It makes you feel something, but you might chalk it up to just being a fairy tale like the rest of the things that happen at Christmas. And you wonder if it really happened and can it change your life? Was Jesus really born? Did the angels really surround Uh, this birth event as it took place angels shepherds wise men a star a manger all of these things is it true but friends i'm here to tell you emphatically this christmas that this story is not like the others in fact it's not a story at all luke chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 tells us this very important 
many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were our witnesses and servants of the Word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Scripture's telling us that Christmas makes us feel good inside, but you need to know that it's not just a morality tale about being a good person. This is careful research about a real and historical person named Jesus who was born in the historical city of Bethlehem, a real place. The Bible does not belong on the same shelf with Elf <laughs> or with the other videos or the other Christmas stories and the other fairy tales. The tradition of reading this account is drastically different from the tradition of the Eden Park Christmas tree commercial. And what I'm holding here in my hand, the Holy Word of God, is important. The collection of ancient documents of real people, just like you and me. It's accurate evidence confirmed by other historical outside sources have proven this scientifically, that Jesus was in fact born and lived and died and yes, miraculously was resurrected from the dead. It's all confirmed by historical evidence. Dear friends, Jesus is real. That's right. That was so perfect. Oh, Jesus is real. Oh, yes. Get the babies in here more often. Get more amens that way. This is hugely significant because it takes us from the territory into facts and not feelings. These facts of Christmas are a part of a grander account of God's work in this world since the beginning of time as we know it. He's had a plan. You may recognize another familiar verse from the Bible that speaks about this. Check it out. John 3.16. You know this one? 3.16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. We know that one. A lot of us miss out on verse 17. For God did not send His, send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. There are some of you here this morning who feel condemned when you came in. And it would have probably been made even worse if we were like in a traditional church building, right? Nothing wrong with those. We, we love to have a permanent place even here at East End. It just hasn't happened yet. But I mean, there's just something about going into to church, you know? You, you've heard the thing, well, if I go in there, the, 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 the ceiling will fall in or whatever. Some of you felt like that today. I've had conversations with people who feel God could never love them because of the sin and the mistakes in their lives, and the church most definitely wouldn't receive them. But friends, I want you to remember that we're not in the territory of feelings anymore. Who cares what people think? <laughs> As the pastor of this community here in East End, I want to say to you, we, we don't care what other people think. We're glad that you're here. Go with the facts this Christmas. God loves you. Go with the facts that Christmas is all about the fact that God loved the world so much He sent His Son to be born. Why? The fact of the imagery that we saw in the Eden Park commercial. You ever feel like that star? You guys remember where he's laying there and he's trying to get up? I know I do. That little star tries and tries to get the top of the tree all by himself. The star goes over and over and over again, all on his own, and nobody's there to help him. He feels completely lonely and abandoned and afraid, and after several attempts, he just lays there helpless and exhausted. Have you ever felt like that? During this past month, we've been talking on Sunday mornings about choosing Christmas. You've heard that woven throughout our entire service in different language. To pursue more than just the Christmas story, but to actually pursue the real Jesus. And we kicked off the series talking about how so many of us are spiritually exhausted. And our lead pastor, Scott Stevens, told us that there are symptoms of soul dehydration that we will embody. Just like a regular dehydration from water we will experience a soul dehydration. And we're like that star, spiritually worn out. And no matter what we do, we can't make it out of that funk that we're in. Just like that little star. We just can't do it. And this is what our sin does to us, church. This is what sin does. It leaves us exhausted, lying there without hope. And you saw that tree in the, 
in the commercial reached down and picked that star up. And friends, God in His mercy on that first Christmas day chose to reach down from heaven and pick us up and rescue us. And that rescue is available to you today. Maybe you're here and you think, if I can just keep trying to be a good person, then I'll be good and God and I'll be good. We'll make it. If I can just be nicer to people this year. <laughs> maybe just not fuss as much when I drive. Or maybe be nicer to my coma. Then God and I will be good. God will put me on the top of the nice list. And I'm here to tell you that you can try all that you want to be a nice person, but that's not going to address the spiritual ache that you feel this time of year trying to earn your acceptance before God constantly trying to make this eternal nostalgic feeling last all year long but you know in the heart of hearts it's eventually going to wear off that's why you have to deal with facts at christmas not feelings the fact is is that god chose us this sets the god of christianity apart from any other god in any other religion i've often said it like this that every other religion in the world it's supposed that god figure says to its supposed followers, you get your life cleaned up first. You do such and such first. Perhaps you face this way and pray a certain way so many times a day first. You do all of these things first. And then as God, I will love you. And maybe you have a chance for my grace and mercy. And what makes true Christianity different from every other religion. I'll take you up on it all day long. I'm not the brightest crayon in the Crayola box, but I can take you up on this one, that Christianity is unique in every, from every other faith in that our God, Yahweh Elohim, through Jesus Christ, reached down when we were at our most unlovable and said, you can't do anything to make me love you anymore and pulled us up cleaned us up by the blood of Jesus, sat us at the banquet table, and then pulled up a chair next to us and said, let's dine together and have a relationship. That is the story of Christmas. When you expand beyond the traditional Christmas story that we hear every year, you understand in the context of history that God chose you. God has already chosen you because He loves you and He wants every person in the world to experience His love. To those who believe in Jesus, even those who are skeptical of Jesus, those who are nice and good people, and those who we would say are naughty. They're on the naughty list. But God doesn't have a naughty and nice list. He has a love list, and your name is on it. He loves you, and that's why He sent His one and only Son to come and to save us from our sin and our spiritual exhaustion. God chose you because He loves you. But at this point, as we start to wrap up, this is where the Eden Park commercial kind of diverges from our, our tale of Christmas. It breaks down just a little bit. Because God doesn't bend down and lift you out of your spiritual exhaustion without your permission. God never forces Himself at any time. I remember hearing a preacher of old when I was younger and he said, God is the perfect gentleman. He'll only stand at your heart's door and knock. He'll never force his way in. So imagine with me for a second that Jesus is that tree. We're the star lying there on the ground. And Jesus comes down that first Christmas and he declares his life purpose to us. I can save you from what's going on in your life, he says. I came down here to set you free from what's got you lying here hopeless. He bent down as the tree of life, and He gently asks you, will you come up with me? You allow me to pick you up out of this mess in your life. And Jesus says, will you follow me to the eternal place of healing and forgiveness and joy and freedom to the true rivers of life? The choice is yours, little star. Will you choose to allow me to lift you up in true freedom? Will you choose to give me the leadership reins of your life so I can lift you higher than you ever thought you could on your own? Jesus said, I've done all this for you. Will you choose to come with me? We've been singing through this Choose Christmas series over the last month. A song that Pastor Scott, um, that God really spoke to Pastor Scott, our lead pastor, through on his sabbatical in the summer. And uh, 
It was that song from Chris McClarney, and we've been singing it just about each week. We didn't this week. And the lyrics go like this. Those of you who've been in attendance, you'll remember. It says, there's healing, there's freedom. There's more than enough for everyone. So we come, Lord, we come. So the decision today is yours if you will come to the Lord or not. That's your decision. Here's the reality of choosing Christmas. If you choose not to allow Jesus to pick you up, then friends, you're on your own. You're back to trying to get to the top by your own effort. You have to work harder to pick yourself up next time you fall down. You'll exhaust yourself trying to feel this nostalgic feeling that Christmas brings. You'll continue to be separated from God, who is the only one who can fill the, fill the void in your life this time of year and all times of year. However, if you choose to allow Jesus to pick you up, then your life is no longer your own. Your life is in His hands, and He will lift you up out of your spiritual dehydration, your spiritual death, and He will bring you to an eternal life of freedom and peace a right relationship with God forever. But dear friends, two last quick things. This freedom comes at a cost. At Northway, we don't preach a, an easy believism because we don't believe that's Scripture. Your faith comes at a cost, dear friends. It's not easy. In fact, your life may get in some cases more difficult at times if you follow Jesus but I can tell you that the peace and the joy and the hope that is there in an eternal well of your soul far surpasses any trouble that you will ever go through in your life there was a massive cost for Jesus Jesus gave up his life for you by dying on the cross for your sin because he wanted to be in a right relationship with you he wanted us to experience freedom there's a massive cost for us, as I said. It costs you letting go of control of your life and allowing Jesus to take over, to make him the leader. you got to follow him. In coming to Jesus and choosing to allow him to lift you up, you give him your life. You give up trying to do it your own way. You're no longer the star of your life show he is. I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment.